Welcome to Ongea East African Music Summit. And uh, as you've heard from uh, the introduction, we are here to talk about live sound, sound engineering, broadcast, and everything pertaining sound in production. Concerts, festivals, and all that. And with us, we have um, our panelists, uh, composed of professionals in uh, the festival scene and uh, live sound and events. So without further ado, let me introduce them from... I can start with you, Olive. My name is Mark Adem. Uh, I'm a musician, a performer. I write my own music. Uh, yeah. Hi, my name is Martin Muller. I'm an events specialist. Hello, my name is Jess White. I run a music festival in Mozambique, produce concerts in Mozambique, South Africa. I run a booking agency called Akum, and I coordinate a Southern African tour circuit which com composes of five festivals across three weekends. My name is Antoine Canela, and uh, I'm, the technical, I'm a technical director for Homeboys Entertainment. Thank you. Uh, the main reason we are here, it's... Uh, a very interesting conversation that uh, Makadem threw to our WhatsApp group about live sound and what needs to be done to improve our production from the event side of things because sometimes you tend to find that the standards are not the same when it comes to this concert. So let's hear what problem Makadem had, then they'll be able to tell us if there's a solution and what we can do about it and how we can improve or what are the challenges and what are the setbacks that we experience. So, Makadim, please. Thank you very much. Uh, basically, any artist uh, has experienced what I've experienced. If you're, whether you're doing live or you're doing, uh, or using playback, because sound is sound, you know. Uh, I've gone to concerts where somebody's playing, is using playback and uh, and uh, they can't even hear what they're singing, you know. Uh, at that point, you can't perform because you have, to, you have to hear yourself sing. Even if you're lip syncing, whatever you're doing, but you have to, to be able to hear what you're doing. Uh, and I'm not talking about Kenya or Nairobi. I'm talking about East Africa because I've done that circuit. 2014, 2015, I went all the way to Jinja, Kampala, Arusha, and it's, it's very bad, you know, because sometimes you even find yourself calling it a waste of time going for sound check because they waste your time going for sound check very early in the morning, you know, or, or very early and this movement is difficult. If you're in a concert or in a festival, you don't have those problems of movement because somebody is taking care of it. But if I have a show in Nairobi and I have to come probably all the way to Karen, all the way to, to Aboretam, all the way to, to, to Westlands to do sound check, then go home. Then you come back in the evening and your guitar is not the same. The, your voices are everywhere. You can't hear your BGVs. You can't hear the guitar, the drama. You know, it's, it's just, the drama is it's just, everything is just drama. You know? And I don't know the reason why, and that's why I brought it to the WhatsApp group. But I realized that's like, most people are thinking, maybe I'm just being argumentative, but I'm not being argumentative, I'm being real about this, because I'm in it all the time, almost every month, and you find that there's a sound engineer who probably, I don't know what happens, what happens between the sound check and the show? That you've done the sound check when you come back, and it's not the same. And why do you even have three or more artists sound checking? You've given them a whole hour to sound check, then they come back, then you don't even know what is going on. You know, those are some of the, the, the things I'm looking at. Why don't you just then don't have just have one person sound checking or have somebody doing that sound check? Because you bring us all the way there to sound check very early, and then we come back and the sound is just horrible, it doesn't even exist. Sometimes you, smaller shows, festivals are a bit better. You find that you have monitors. But in the smaller concerts, some of these guys think that 
not bringing monitors is cutting down the, uh, their cost. So they don't bring monitors. Not knowing that if you're a live performer, how do you even perform with no monitors? I mean, you, you can't be hearing yourself from the other end. Sometimes it comes as an echo or it doesn't even come at all. You know? And uh, some of these guys, like in River Road, whereby you actually lose your voice because it doesn't even have effects. It's totally dry and you struggle and all these things. So my, my intention was, how can we sensitize the sound guys in East Africa to think that, because what I think is that uh, most people organizing events, even bigger events in East Africa, they think more in terms of the hotels where the artists will sleep, air tickets, they think that's a big deal. Um, they think more of uh, the stage. It's very nice, you know, with the lights, you know, all that crap. But when it comes to the sound, it's not there. But this is what you're selling. You're selling that these guys are going to perform. I'm coming to perform. I have to project. My voice has to be heard properly, clearly in every place. Not, you know, you know what I mean? At the guitar... You find that your guitar, if you're playing with the band, probably sometimes your guitar did not start. I've been told in recent times that we were not hearing your voice in the last 30 minutes. I'm like, really? You know, those kind of things. So how can we make uh, the show organizers, the event organizers realize that just like you're looking for a good hotel for the artist or good transport, per diem, you're looking for big artists, so that they bring in people to hear what? Very, very genuine and hard ch challenges right there from an artist. And I want to believe a lot of artists have gone through this. I myself was once an artist and was a victim of poor sound. So, And from his complaint and his discussion, I think... The event organizers have a lot to answer. Martin? <laughs> I could, I could uh, feel the agony in Makadem's voice uh, just trying to explain um, what he's had to deal with. Um, but one of the things that um, <clears throat> we are doing as an industry, um, this is the, our third year in operation now uh, as Events Managers Association of Kenya. Um, one of the things that we are really working towards is professionalism. Um, if, you're, if you say you provide sound, what quality of sound are you pr providing? If you say that you're a um, specialist in lighting, what kind of lighting are you providing? So that what we have done is pose a challenge to our members to ensure that they first of all understand what is expected of them as providers in the industry. But one of the things that um, I will keep saying is that any artist who understands their business must put their foot down. Any artist who understands what that, that is where they get their money from must demand, not request, demand for exactly what it is that they want. Do not leave a sound check until and unless you're happy. When international acts come to Kenya, it doesn't matter how long it will take, but they will not leave that set until they're satisfied with the sound. Now, I, 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 I hear what uh, Makadem talks about, that you leave the sound, uh, you leave a uh, sound check, and the sound is fine. And you go back uh, in the evening, and the sound is crap. And that is 100% responsibility of the event organizer because they're supposed to hire a qualified sound engineer so that they understand what it takes. 
Um, and one of the things that I know for a fact that um, has slowly is happening in Kenya today is that artists are beginning to appreciate a technical rider. Um, three, four, five years ago, Kenyan artists had no idea what even a technical rider was. But some of the artists who are now exposed, I believe academia have a technical rider, um, will understand what it takes uh, to have a technical rider. So it's for, because this is your trade, you must make sure as an artist that you get what you have asked for. But um, just to throw sp spanner in the works, when it comes to an artist demanding for what they perceive to be the right kind of equipment to help them perform better, how do budgets come into play and how does it affect the technical aspect of you know, the setup? Because yes, I might demand, I'm like, yeah, I'm this kind of artist XYZ, I use console XYZ, but you as an event organizer, you'll come and tell me, we cannot afford that console. Uh, you know, um, a technical rider is not an overnight. I mean, you don't get the technical rider uh, the night before the event. You, take, you get the technical rider um, a couple of weeks or months before the event happens. So for an event manager to come back and tell you uh, that you gave the technical right, maybe the event is for, we're in February, so the event is for March or April. And you know that this act is going to be at the show and you have a technical rider. It is upon you as the event organizer to make sure that you provide the equipment that is required because that is what makes the artist an artist. You cannot, you cannot give, um, you cannot, um, I mean, that's what makes the person, that's what he does for his work. So you cannot give a graphic designer a laptop or a computer and not give him the software to do the graphic work and expect him to deliver. It's that simple. So any event organizer worth their salt understands the need of a technical writer. Cool. So if you're an upcoming artist or an established artist, maybe you're wondering, what is a technical writer? How many of you know what, what a technical writer is? Just those few ones. And the rest... Do you know what a technical rider is? Do we tell you what a technical rider is? <laughs> Antoine can, can elaborate on that. Well, let's hear from Jess, who comes from Mozambique. And Touching on the uh, technical rider, it's not just the artist that needs a technical rider. When, if you produce events at a venue, you need to know what are the technical capabilities of that venue. What is their in-house system, what they're using. So when you start a conversation with an artist, you can say, this is, this is our system, this is what we can provide, this is our standard backline. And then you start the negotiation with the artist. And that should be happening as soon as you start talking with the artist. Same time as you're talking fees, you should be talking technical. It shouldn't be happening the night before the event or the week before the event. With the festival I run in Mozambique, it takes place in the third week of May. I have all of my technical writers from all of my artists five months before the event. So that my production manager can review all technical writers, sit down with our production company to, to see what we can provide within our budget and if there's something that we cannot provide, we start that conversation with the artists three, four months in advance. Because they, there might be certain equipment that is just unavailable in Mozambique. So just besides organizing the event, there's a production team that is handling the production of the performances. Yes. So to produce a festival, you, you need many teams. We, we have over 300 staff to produce the festival. And in one of those areas is hiring a, a competent production company to bring sound, stage and lighting. Hiring a competent production manager to ensure that that company does their job properly. 
and ensure that the conversations between the artists and their requirements are met. And then that production manager's job during the event is to ensure everything runs smoothly, to make sure that what the artist hears at soundcheck, they're hearing when they come on stage. Now, if you have a digital monitor, it, it's quite easy because you can, you can preset. But if you're using analog, then you need to make sure from a practical perspective that the sound engineer takes a photo so he, he has all the settings and he can make, have those settings exactly how they were at soundcheck when the artist hits stage and you do a, a quick one to two minute line check and then the artist starts their performance sounding great. At so many festivals you go and the first 20, 30 minutes sounds terrible. It's not until halfway through their set that the artist is starting to sound good. But at festivals you play for 40 minutes, 50 minutes, an hour. So if the sound's not great, you're ruining that performance. And you're ruining the performance for the audience who have paid money to come to your event. You're ruining the event for the artists that are playing at your event. And any event manager needs to think that th through two lens, they need to make sure their audience enjoys the concert and they need to make sure their artists enjoy it. They're the two main things when running an event. If you get them right, then you, you'll run a successful event. Good. So, Antoine, from, from a technical perspective, how do you compromise the demands of the artists the, the, from, the, from a technical perspective and the demands of the event organizer? Because I, I believe both of them have a certain expectation, expectation technically. So how, at, how do you balance those, those two elements? You know, first we... Okay, I'm, I'm just talking on my side. Uh, we are trying not to compromise. Okay? So if we have... Uh, also, it's, uh, it's about passion. So if, um, if I have to do a concert, obviously the budget is... Uh, uh, if it's low budget, but I, I will always try to, to give the best that we can. Now, uh, I'm completely agree with Macadem. Um, it's, uh, I've experienced before, before, before going to and working for Home Boys, I was a sound engineer and I was touring and uh, also a technical director for many festivals in, uh, in Africa. Then we met uh, in part of Africa, in Congo. And uh, you know, what you are saying, it's um, uh, don't leave the stage before you are happy. But sometimes an artist can feel, I will not be happy at all, even if I stay five hours on the stage. Uh, the big difference between what I've experienced in my country and in Europe and in Africa, it's maybe in Europe because we have support, and we have support from our country. Artists have su got support. Artists can afford to say, okay, I'm not satisfied. I'm not going to play. This is big difference with here in Africa that they can't afford to say, no, I'm not going to play because they have to eat. So sometimes you can see they just go to work because there are no options. They are not enjoying. Yeah, they are not enjoying. So if you, you don't enjoy, you don't deliver. And, and it happened for the same for um, even for technicians. All uh, this industry doesn't, doesn't have any support. So, they are so because we don't have support, we don't have any regulation. Then sometimes, yes, uh, as, you know, as you said, sometimes we have, I did uh, many, many events where uh, the budget was so low. How as a, a company, how, how you want to invest on new equipment if you, just, if you just have the money to pay your people? So if you, if you can see, uh, we don't change equipment. We don't go with the technology. We stay with our old equipment, our old cables, our old microphone, because it's an economical problem. 
it comes back again to budgets. <laughs> yeah, but I think all it's coming about the budget. I think many times, I think 80% of your time, Macadam, you are feeling underpay. It's the same for us. We are feeling that, okay, we are working for, okay, we will pay the transport, we will pay our people, but equipment, we will not have this money to invest. In another set of... We cannot upscale and modernize our setups. Exactly. So. This is what I'm feeling. Okay, I'm, and that's what I said. I'm, I'm just talking on, yeah, on my side. And the big difference also, it's for, uh, and for an event organizer, uh, it's, uh, for me, if I have a complaint, it's you are making the, the too big difference between an African artist and an artist, uh, or a Kenyan artist, and an artist from abroad. Yeah, equipment is there in Kenya. But you can see it when international artists, they are coming. When it's Kenyan artist, we keep it on the side. Event organizers, you're not paying our it, technical guys. So we, uh, okay, I'm not, I'm not talking about. You know, and he's right. You know, you're right, and he's right that this is happening when it's, uh, it's not the big concert. Okay, big concert. We, we, I think in Kenya we are professional, and um, we. If I see all the big concerts, or like uh, what we are doing now at uh, on boys at KCC, or the Safaricom Jazz Live, all this, the, this is not, uh, this is a, a sta in, okay, the standard. For but also, uh, there's, there's something I noticed, like if an international artist is coming to tour in the country, like um, I, I was around when homeboys were doing the Tiny Temper event, he came with a team. He came with a sound guy. He came with a production guy. So is that something, as Kenyan artists, is that something you're looking into having, maybe as a way of helping you improve your performances and so that you can be the same artist who is trying to figure out what frequencies are my microphones on, how do I sound? You can't be monitoring yourself. You need to have a trusted ear seated by uh, the FOH doing that for you. Maybe just before Musyoka uh, Bakadem answers that, and just to pick up from where he, uh, Antoine has left, um, <clears throat> one thing we, we must appreciate is that um, the eventing industry in this country, the events industry in this country has come a long way. Oh, yes, definitely. Um, about 10, 15 years ago, we literally flew in every piece of equipment for an international act. Today, um, acts that come to Kenya um, rely on equipment, local, um, local equipment. I mean, uh, companies that have invested in equipment in Kenya. Uh, Kenyan companies, um, and Ant Antoine will, I'm sure will agree with me, supply Tanzania, supply Uganda, Zambia, Malawi, Zimbabwe, uh, Nigeria, South Sudan, Ethiopia, I mean, Kenya. Well, Kenyan companies supply sound and technical equipment uh, to all these countries. So we've come a long way. I appreciate the fact that, um, yes, uh, budgets will always be an issue. Um, but for me, uh, and where we come from as uh, Event Managers Association, is that at the end of the day, two things must happen. You must deliver value for money, and you must deliver quality. And what we, I even um, when I was um, a practitioner, what I insisted on doing with my clients is I used a phrase that they thought was very rude, but it's the reality. You pay peanuts, you get sim sim. You get monkey. You know, so it's, it's basically, it's, if you want a good show, put money in the weight. The artists will love the stage. They'll give their all. You put in uh, small money, again, you get, um, I mean, Makadem will not give, will not give him his, uh, will not give you his best. And at the end of the day, um, it's, there, it's 
his reputation at stake, it's my uh, reputation as an, uh, as an event organizer at stake. So it's both of us have to be in sync. So, artists. <laughs> when you talk about the issue of artists having managers and stuff, when you pay an artist 90 million, <laughs> and the sound is still not good, he complained. And he came with the entire technical team. So, to some point, it's not even the equipment. I remember many years ago, we had a producer from England in Ketable called Andy from Abubila, and I asked him, if you look at this studio, why can't it produce a good reggae beat that is as heavy as a Jamaican one, a good R&B rhythm that's as heavy as R. Kelly's R&B? Then he looked at the equipment as if he had not seen it before. <laughs> then he looked at me, and he said, I think the problem is with the engineers. That's what he said. He looked at it and said, I think the problem is with the engineers. I don't see anything. I don't see why they wouldn't. And he'll agree with me. And he's just said, nowadays, there's a time I was told there's a support equipment that was taken to South Africa from here. South Africa, of all places, being supported by equipment from Kenya. So that tells you that almost everything is here. And to some point, it's not even the budget. Because it's not just the small concerts that have those problems. The real festivals in, in Kenya, and like I said, in East Africa, have those problems. And I don't know why. Is it that, me, I tend to think that probably what Antoine is saying, they, they might be giving a small budget to the sound, yet they've paid the artist a lot of money. They've flown artists all the way to Uganda, flown artists all the way to Nairobi to perform to a small, tiny sound. I mean, if you really want a good uh, show, I think the show is not just having a big act. And that's why you find, like, you're telling us the international artists come with their own lineup of the technical side. Because probably they know that in Africa there is a problem. There is no producer. Because in most of the shows, I've never seen anybody saying it's the producer of that stage or the technical, like I had a friend who came from the US last year and he calls himself a technical producer. That's all he knows. That's what he calls himself. So he knows everything about that, what is going on. But here you find that sometimes you don't even know who the sound guy is. He doesn't even want to talk to you. True, he doesn't even want to talk to you. You're disturbing him. You're not the one who gave him the job to do. So. To, to some point, I think it's also lack of passion for what you're doing. If it's not the money, like uh, this gentleman is saying, you pay peanuts, you get monkey. It's also lack of passion, to some of these the, the, the sound engineers, because they don't even want to talk to you. You complain, they're like, what do you know? You're not a sound engineer. Like, if you see what I posted earlier, I posted, I posted the poster of uh, this event today, and I said, I'm not a sound engineer. I was shielding myself against criticism. <laughs> I said, I'm not a sound engineer. But I am a beneficiary and a victim of sound. If it is good, I'm a beneficiary. If it is crap, I'm a victim. And by the way, most of the time the revelers don't think it is the sound owner who is bad. Those are people who know techniques. They think the artist was crap. That's what they tell you today. Your show was, you know. <laughs> wow. Very, very passionate. <laughs> and, and a distressed uh, user of sound services. But let me ask just maybe from his point of view and from his experience handling events. I'm sure... Your event didn't start big. It must have started from somewhere. Nobody starts a festival getting 5,000 people. Yes. Nobody starts a, a weekly concert getting 500 people or 1,000 people. You start small, you scale it up. 
And the key to be successful is you need to understand what is your reality, work within that. Like, so when ASGO Festival started, it wasn't out of festival grounds. It was in a, a small venue in Maputo that attracted 300 people. Now how many people do you get? So now the festival gets 5,000 people each day, two stages. How many days does it run? Two days. Two days. And so it, it's about scaling it. So for the first few years, the budget was small. So instead of going and spending money on, on a venue and money on staging and money on fencing and security, you find an existing venue that has that and you partner with them so that you can still employ a good sound team. You can still spend money on artists. You can still spend money on your production team. Every person who works as Go Festival gets paid. So we employed 322 people last year. 322 people got paid. We, we don't get volunteers and interns in to do a role <coughs> where someone should be qualified to do. That's a non-negotiable. We get volunteers and interns in to, to learn from professionals, but they're, they're not in charge of running a stage. They're not in charge of stage managing or keeping things to time. They're there to shadow and learn because I see my role as an event producer is not only about putting on a good event now, it's about growing the industry so that other people can produce good events. Because you don't want to be the only successful event in your country because you want to have many successful promoters, festivals, nurturing the scene because then it means that the artists are getting more shows, the artists are getting paid regularly, they're, they're getting paid better, they're, they're playing on better stages to better sound so that they've got a su sustainable income. It means that your sound team has a sustainable income. If you're only produced, if, if, you ho if you own sound equipment and you're not getting enough shows, then you're going to go out of business. Like, I think the way we need to all look at this at all end, from the sound engineer to the artist to the event producer, is we're all creative entrepreneurs. And we need to make sure that each of us respect what, what the other party needs to do their job properly. And that means good communication. If your sound engineer is not talking to the artist, fire the sound engineer. Now, last year, I produced a Joss Stone concert in Maputo. Um, she was on her tour. She came to Kenya the week before. She walked in and she, she said that the, the sound company that we had hired had, had run one of the cables incorrectly along the ground. And it was too risky. And the sound company was refusing to change it. They are like, no, this is how we do it in Mozambique. Me, as the event producer, went up to the sound engineer and said, well, if you're not going to change it, then I'll, I'll get a new company. The, the person in charge was refusing, so I said, I'm going to pay you your wage for today, and you're going home. And I'm going to hire someone in who's going to listen to the artists and make sure that the sound is good. Because it wasn't because it was Joss Stone. It was because it was an artist. Every concert I produce in Mozambique, if I'm bringing an international artist, has to have a Mozambican artist as the main support. The festival, 60% of the artists who, who perform in our stage are Mozambican. 100% of our suppliers are Mozambican. We could hire sound from South Africa for cheaper because South African companies are getting more shows so they can charge less. Mozambican companies are getting less shows, so they have to charge higher. But how, how can I nurture the Mozambican industry if I'm hiring South African equipment that I can get in, in Mozambique? And Kenya has an advantage where the industry is much bigger and, and you have the equipment and you can actually export that equipment. Now, Mozambique is not exporting any facet of the industry, from sound to artists to managers to forums. It's, it's a very new scene. There's four major music festivals. The biggest festival is called Zilk Festival, which gets 25,000 people per day. 
and this is exactly what's been mentioned before. They get 25,000 people per day who are paying roughly about $20 to get in. They will pay their headline artists $70,000 to come from Angola. They'll do 15 airfares from Luanda to Maputo, five business class, 10 economy to get that artist there. They'll put them in a five-star hotel. They'll give them a good per diem. Last year, that festival opened gates four hours late. So the music started four hours after it was meant to start. So that artist that they had spent $70,000 on a fee and all the money on flights, he was meant to come on stage at 12.30. He came on stage at 8.45 in the morning. So eight hours and 15 minutes late. The sound was terrible and, and he was eight hours late. There's no, res no respect from, from that promoter to that artist and to the 25,000 people who were still there at nine in the morning on Sunday. Like, they, they were still there waiting to see that artist. And because of that, their sponsors got very heavy backlash. Social media, the press, went to town on the festival. So their sponsors were like, well, how can I align myself with such a festival that doesn't respect its audience, that doesn't respect its artists? So that the, the effect of running things badly can actually cripple the event. So the event, which has been a two-day event for, for 10 years, this year will be a one-day event because their sponsorship income is halved. Hopefully they hire a proper production company. Wow, very nice insight there. And just be, before we go into our Q&A, uh, as all this discussion is going, I'm picking up the, the um, like we need to have like a standardized system. Whether it's an artist coming from abroad, whether it's a local artist. Yes, definitely an artist coming from outside may have much heavier requirements because of the kind of exposure and the kind of music they're used to. But do we need to have a standard? Like, if it's Kenyan artists, the technical rider is this level. As in, what's, what standard should we set for productions? The standard needs to be the same no matter where the artist comes from. You, you shouldn't be treating an artist that comes from abroad differently to a Kenyan artist. The, where it comes into standards, it depends on, on which aspects. Like, from an artist's perspective... Like the artists need to have a technical writer and they need to have an a, a clause in their contract that protects them if that technical writer is not provided. As a booking agent, I, I look after nine artists. All of those nine artists have a technical writer. Like Two-thirds of those artists tour with their sound technician. The other third can't afford to tour with their sound technician. But we do not sign any contract that doesn't protect us if if the sound is not quality. So if they get on stage and they're not happy, they can walk off because the contract will protect them, they'll still be paid. Musuka, um, just uh, picking up from where um, he said, um, one of the things that um, we must accept as, as, as Kenyans is that we have accepted mediocrity for a very long time. We have accepted medi mediocrity for such a long time that anyway, Sini Kenya, you know, and we need to move away from that because we will be left. The world is moving ahead. We will be left behind. So, as an artist, you must understand that you have no other side hustle. Makadem lives off his music. He doesn't have another, he doesn't have an eight to five. I live off events. I don't have an 8 to 5. My 8 to 5 is events. I mean, that's all I do, morning to evening. And so, if we start respecting ourselves as artists in Kenya, and standing your grounds, and just... I'll give you an example. Why is it in this country, why is it that Saudi Soul today can demand specific things 
and any other artist is not able to. What makes Saudi Soul different, and I'm sorry to use this example, what makes Saudi Soul different from my brother here? They're all Kenyans. They're all artists. But they see their value. They see themselves as a business. Once you see yourself as a business, then people will take you a little more seriously. So maybe what we need to do is step back and look at the business aspect of your trade. Because that's what makes, gives, uh, places bread and butter on, on the table every day. It's the same thing. A lawyer will not handle your matter if you do not give a down payment for the file to be opened. So, as an artist, you must then realize that this is my business. I have no other income apart from what I do. My voice is my investment. That is my God-given talent. So, as long as we're not, we don't understand ourselves as a business, then we'll be taken around by God knows whoever else is doing it. The other thing is that as um, of course there's the talk of standardization of um, do we need a standard or anything like that. Um, currently I sit in a task force that was mandated um, by the Tourism uh, Regulatory Authority um, to come up with regulations. And some of these regulations, um, and um, Antoine picked up on that, is that it's happening, that it's happening in, in South Africa, it's happening in Europe, it's happening in the Americas, that there's, got, there's a standard, there's an upper limit and there's a lower limit. Yeah? That you cannot go below this to provide a certain entertainment, certain um, requirements for a performance. And as an artist, um, we have to understand that the world is changing and we need to change with the world and treat us as business people. That if I have a technical rider, that technical rider must be protected within my contract that I sign. You can negotiate about specifications in terms of what gear uh, is available in that country but the things that you will not be able to compromise on. If, for example, I want um, an ear on mic uh, monitor, give me, I, I, I hear myself better with the monitor on my ear than the monitor on the floor. So I'm not going to compromise on that because I perform better when I'm hearing in the ear than when I'm hearing on the monitor. So it's small, small things that we'd want to take for granted that will compromise our performance and what we do. The other problem we have in Kenya is that a lot of us are buying equipment, calling ourselves um, sound engineers, but do not even understand what that piece of equipment can do for you. And so, yes, um, it's a problem in the industry. It's stuff that we're working uh, towards... Um, trying to steam, uh, streamline, but the bigger production companies in Kenya today, um, Homeboys uh, and, and, and the others, have actually now stepped up in terms of sound engineering. That they have specific individuals who just do sound. They have specific individuals who just do lights. So you will not find a guy who's, doing, who's on the mixing board on the lights board because... Those are two different aspects of, of, of the production. I mean, it is production, but it's different. So specialize in one area and stick to it. So as an industry, as, 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 an, as an association in Kenya, these are things that we're talking about. Uh, we're having conversations with our members um, so that at the end of the day, we give value for money for both our clients and their patrons. Because at the end of the day, it reflects on us as an industry. Wow. Thank you for that insight. And um, clearly, huh? Yeah. Um. Basically, me, I think, uh, like he says, uh, we have many, I'll call them quacks, with, equi with good equipment. But um, me, what I think, uh, the event organizers 
don't put a lot of uh, weight on sound themselves. They, they put a lot of weight most of the time on the artist. They want the artist, they'll give the artist the money he wants. But the event organizers forget that the sound has to be equal to task. Whereby you make sure that you're bringing in somebody who can do Even if it's just a small setup in a pub. Like, I've seen that in Europe. Just a band equipment in a small pub. It's great. The first time I went to Europe, I went to Womex. And there were like 19-year-olds, 21-year-olds girls. There were three of them who were changing. Each time an artist is done, these three girls will come to change the equipment to, and put in a new technical rider into place. And they were doing it within 15 to 20 minutes. Done. Showing you that that was just professionalism. So it's up to the event organizers, in my view, to insist on that. The way they insist, I want this particular artist. And they get that particular artist for that amount of money. They should insist. But I think the event organizers also don't know what sound is. If you know what sound is, you will definitely want to hear. Because me, it beats me. Probably even the event organizers there. The sound engineers there. The whole team is there. Just because I don't have my team, I have my voice on the monitor, and it is not on the other end. How? To a point that I'm told after this, but we're not even hearing your voice. I mean, and, the, and there's a technical guy on the other end. What is he here? What am I supposed to be doing on this stage that is not here, that doesn't bother him? I, I'm playing the guitar, and it's not coming out, and he's just there <laughs> sipping on his Coca-Cola. Really. So I think it ha it's, it's up to the event organizers really to put a lot of this into their, in, in, into, into the event. That the sound, just like I want a good artist, I want a good venue, I have a lot of people, the sound must be just right. I, I, Makadem, I agree with you 100%. What, um, what we must understand as a country is that, unfortunately... There's people who do not understand the difference between a promoter and an event organizer. The promoter is the one who pays for the artist. So Musyoka has a big purse. So Musyoka will get artist X. But Musyoka has no clue what it takes for artist X to be good on stage. And that's where there's the disconnect. Because unfortunately, um, a lot of promoters who are bringing artists into the country do not understand um, what a marketing is talking about. Me, I've paid you. So you, say, you want X amount. I've paid you. You sort it out. But they have no clue what it takes to bring um, uh, that artists on stage. Um, Makadem referred to um, Chris Brown coming to, to Mombasa. Who did the event for Chris Brown? I don't know. I'm in the industry. Somebody just paid and said, I'm going to bring these artists. But they don't understand what it takes for them to be on the stage. It's not about big, uh, big setup. Yeah. It's about the quality of what is coming out of that stage. Half of the time, the sound on the PA is different from the sound on the stage. And that's why you have lapses, because the guy cannot hear himself. The PA and what is on stage is not in sync. So it goes back to do we really understand this trade or are we just getting into it for the sake of getting into it for you to say that I'm in the events industry or I'm an, a producer or I'm, I'm a sound engineer? It's, it's small, small things like that that we don't think about that go a long way. Now, for us as uh, events association um, is that we are very slowly but very, very carefully working with individuals who understand what it takes to produce good sound? Because 
if an artist, if Makadem comes on stage and performs on stage and is like, wow, I loved that. For me, I have won. Because the artist is happy. If the artist is happy, it means that the crowd is happy because he will give his performance of his life. But as long as Makadem is not happy, then the crowd will never be happy. And they'll say, oh, but you didn't perform well. He will not perform well as long as the tools that he's using for his trade are wrong. Wow. So, can I just add on that? Yes, like, please. Before we go then, so after this, we'll do a Q&A. So, l last year, Sean Kingston came to Johannesburg and he was to play two concerts. In the first concert, the sound was terrible. And he was, he was playing with a backing track so it, sh it should be simple, but the sound was terrible, and the backlash was was big from the audience. The next day, Sean Kingston said, "I don't trust the sound, so I'm going to do the show a cappella." And the reason why he wanted to do it a cappella was that he couldn't trust the sound production, and he knew that if he did a cappella, he would prove to the audience that that, that his performance is still world class. Because he was very hurt by the allegations that, that, that he wasn't a good live performer. And it had nothing to do with his performance. It had to do with the, the production. So the next night he did a full 60-minute set a cappella. And it was amazing. And the thing is, like, so as an artist, there's always a challenge. And, and sometimes artists can, can do what Sean Kingston did and, and overcome that. Sometimes there's, there's things that go beyond promoted, like if the power cuts out, like you can keep playing acoustically or change up the set or something, jump into the crowd and do an acoustic track or a cappella. Like, like artists and event managers need to be flexible because every, every event, something will go wrong. It's how you respond to something going wrong is whether your event will be successful. There's... There's a clip of Rihanna. I don't know if you've watched it. It's, uh, it's on YouTube. She started a, sh uh, a show. Then like 30 seconds into the performance, the songs just went off. And because she's Rihanna, she stood up, abused everyone, <laughs> apologized to the fans, and said, we are restarting the show. I mean, very few artists have that kind of clout to, to stand up and demand. But I mean, it's... It starts somewhere, and hopefully one day you'll be able to stand up and fire the engineer right there. <laughs> so we can go to our Q&A before we wound up. We have about 15 minutes. So, And can we keep them to questions? Uh, yes. Sir. A lot of times it ends up being statements, and time is, yeah, is running. We'll, we'll be kicked out of here in 15 minutes. So is there a microphone for the floor? or yes, We can start. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Bismarck. I'm from Nakuru. Yes. So I have like two questions. Uh, one, uh, I be, uh, I'm an event professional. I started working on events in 2014. That was my first gig. And I got like 4,000 people for my first gig. Uh, but that was working like for, with artists and DJ Mo and DJ Sadiq. So I had like guys to hold me up from my first gig. So the second year, 2014, we did it with Sadiq only, but I got to learn a few things. Then 2016, uh, the first, uh, before 9 a.m. in the morning, I was jailed because of an event. So there's a duo that came out of, out of TPF. I don't know the name. If, do you know them? <laughs> yeah. So, the, so my question is, like, as an event professional, we are starting. There are a lot of guys who really care about events. And we don't really have like the platform to like get to learn the basics, just like handling artists because like we pay them. I pay the artists, but we didn't sign a contract. But getting the money, the con their contract was saying like when you get the money back, you get it ha half of it. But I didn't sign the contract. So after there, I shut the door of events for me doing there after getting arrested then at 2015, 1st January. So maybe f f my question is, 
from this show, like, do you have like opportunities for guys who don't think about anything else apart from events and the power it has to change the world? And the second question is about innovation. What kind of innovation is going on in the in events industry right now that we can mitigate on the issues you're raising? Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, despite, okay, the panelists was more definitely on the technical than more on the what an event is. And I believe Martin can maybe direct you to maybe some guys who are going to handle... Just, if, if you can just uh, see me after the show, yeah. um, I'll, I'll, I can talk to you about it. But um, just to, uh, very quickly, um, how do you give somebody money and you don't sign a contract? I mean, dude... Let's start here, then we'll go. Thank you. Um, I guess I would love to ask questions, as Jess really said, and precise questions. But as someone who runs and programs a series of festivals in Uganda and has worked with Macadam on two events, I would really be bad to leave this room without answering your question and the reason as to why we are here. We are here because we need to understand and understand the politics that is within the industry itself the events management itself, you know. You as a prolific and great and amazing artist, you apply for a festival, for a market, for this event. Now the people to be nailed here are probably me and Jess, right? Because when an artist applies, the technical writer comes with that application, right? Now there are some coordinators who sit back, they never get back to the artist and say, we don't have a motif XF8 because it's expensive. They just keep quiet. And then Macadam comes in, only to appear to a shock of a keyboard that is crappy and basic, right? And as the audience watching you, they're not going to understand those technicalities of, wow, it's the sound guy, it's this person that is are really terrible. They'll say, Macadam was horrible, never go to his show, never book him. But now we're saying, how can we work with the sound people? And we need the sound people to be honest with us, man. If you cannot work on an orchestra, say, I've never worked on one, and I'm not going to work on it. But as homeboys, I'm going to give you sound. Bring your sound person. We work together so I can learn, and then we have a great show. But some of those people, the sound engineers themselves, do not accept defeat because when they accept, they're out of business. So they say, we know how to do it. We're going to do it. And then the artist shows up only to show up to... Uh, a mess. Now, the issue of standards. I come from a festival where everyone is important, and Macadam, you can testify to that. We don't care whether you're coming from America as an artist or from Kenya or from South Sudan. You're the same people. There's no big deal of this person will sleep in this room. That is your lounge. That is your everything. You're the same people. But I come as a performer myself who plays festivals too. It is so sad that you submit a technical rider only to appear to a sound check and they say you have five minutes, but the artists who they paid millions of money, they say they have three hours of sound check. Now for the technical part, if you cannot do a live mixing, you better get a digital mixer that saves everything so that we don't have shocks. That's what I can say. Thank you. Um, I mean, everybody knows there's a lot of kind of musical energy in Nairobi at the moment. And what I've been noticing is there's, there's a, a lot of informal events uh, being run by informal event organizers, to give it the polite term. Um, and I know that you talked a little bit about regulation. And um, it would be a shame to apply regulation to stop small events going on and to stop that kind of innovative creativity of people wanting to do different stuff that isn't the same as everybody else. But how do we make it safe for the artists and the audiences in that kind of environment where we've got lots of small informal event organizers kind of randomly putting things together without the knowledge? Well, uh, thanks for that, Jude. Um, it's about understanding the expectations. So there's a lot of informal events that happen where people put a concert in their backyard or in their living room and they're not going to have a big sound stage lighting but the artists will know that before they're going. They're not expecting to walk onto a 
uh, by Imba stage. They're in a, a, a friend of theirs' backyard. So it's firstly understanding the expectation and the reality. So communication is the key. Now, informal events are a great way for people to start out and actually get their foot into the industry. So I think we need to be encouraging them and not regulating them too hard. But I think us as experienced professionals need to support them as well. Now, that can be one of the love projects that um, was mentioned earlier. So you might be able to, to lend them some sound equipment as a way of sponsoring the event. Or an artist might come play for free. Or a sound engineer might come play for free. Um, but the thing is, you don't want everybody coming for free because it's a business. For us, really, um, and just to answer you, um, every, every big event um, organizer started small. Uh, so you start off 20 guys, 30 guys on a weekend um, and grow into this monster. Uh, so for us, uh, we'd love to embrace those small gigs because you've got to start from somewhere. Um, what we would do is um, encourage you to, um, and encourage the small uh, events to go on, but they, you must be honest with, with whoever you're dealing with. You must be honest with your crowd. You must be honest with, with your artists. That um, it's, don't expect too much. It's just a small gig, uh, 100 guys, 50 guys. Um, and this is, this is the standards and these are the conditions. So communicate, communicate, communicate. Um, and just reach out to reach out to people who you know uh, who have made it in the industry and I, I guarantee you they will be more than willing to help. Wow. We have a question there. Thank you very much. My name is Yutikas. I wanted to ask about how do you ensure sustainability of events, keeping in mind that you have these high overheads and you need to have good quality for your patrons and for the people that you're serving. So how do you ensure sustainability? Because keeping in mind uh, an example of two award ceremonies in Kenya, they are no longer around, for example, Chat Awards and Kisima. So how do you avoid those pitfalls and those things that may impediment you from doing a good event next year. Thank you. It's a business. So if you produce an event, you need to make a profit. If you're an artist, you need to earn a living, which means making a profit. That's the only way things can be sustainable is if the industry is treated as an industry. It's not a hobby where people have fun on the weekend. Like, if you look at the entertainment industry, it employs, like, it, I'm just going to pull a number out of, the, out of the air for Kenya, but it would be 7-8% of, of the working people would be relating to industry. If you go to a venue like The Alchemist, they might have 40 staff when you look at the bar staff, the cleaners, the food trucks, the security, all of the Uber drivers there. They're all benefiting off arts and culture. So... The, the sustainability is on making things profitable. And the thing is, mate, working through events like on Gaia and leveraging off that platform to learn from experienced professionals, asking questions, visiting the, the stalls out there which are relevant that you think you can learn from, Sh passing that knowledge down makes things more sustainable looking at ways to get money from publishing, looking at ways to get money from, from the telcos. Um, who in here has downloaded mu music illegally before? Come on, don't be shy. Like, so if you want the industry to be sustainable, then... Like, if you want to listen to a, 
an artist, you, sh- you should be paying for that music. Like, um, don't listen to it on YouTube. Don't listen to it on SoundCloud. Like, but buy it digitally. Like, or if you can't afford it, go to their show. Like, but the thing is, you need to look at every aspect. And the thing is, the industry can only be sustainable if it is treated as an industry the same way as every other major industry in an economy is. Just to answer you very quickly, um, the day you will learn that what you do is a business and not a hobby is the day you will break even. Wow. Nice quote. It's never a hobby, and I don't think we are here because we are hobbyists. Personally, I've been doing this for the last 19 years, so I've never been employed. I don't know anything else, so I didn't get to a point where I started halfway. It's, it's everything that I've done, and I believe it's the same for everybody. I'm, I mean, when I started, he was an artist. <laughs> yeah. and he's still an artist, so he didn't get somewhere and he's like, ah, this hobby doesn't work anymore, so... Let me move to something else. There's a lady with a question there. That will be the last question so that we wrap up the session. Just very quickly. I, I mean, we basically just need to change the narrative. We just need to change the narrative. If that's what you do, that's what you do. You know? Uh, and a lot of times, even when, when artists go to, to, to interviews, uh, the question is, okay, so this is what you do. Yeah, but what else do you do? We need, you, we need to change that narrative. Uh, hi, my name is DJ Shock. I'm founder of the Association of Disc Jockeys East Africa. I'm based in Kenya. Uh, my question was really, I don't know if we really discussed funding. Event ideas are definitely there. And I believe that many of the event managers and organizers in this room want to do them without mediocrity. But if, if you can advise us on the best way to, get, to go about finding funding, is corporate sponsorship the only way to get funding? So just to answer you, um, and it's good shock you've, you've asked the question. Uh, we are in a forum uh, together. Um, one of the things that we're planning as, uh, as EMAC uh, later in the year is to put together um, some sort of a workshop where we'll discuss... Um, event funding as a topic on its own, as a standalone. So we'll defi- uh, it's definitely a work in progress. It's at the back of our, it's, a, it's, it's top of our mind. So thank you very much for listening to us. And uh, I hope you've taken home something uh, and that will work towards improving our events and making sure that we sound great uh, whenever we, we go to perform. And we also need the support of the audience, despite us being the stakeholders. Everybody else is interconnected. We are all interconnected. You enjoy, we provide a good service. So with that, I'd like to say thank you to Ongea and wish you a happy evening and enjoy.